and unto thee shall be his desire that I shall rule over him. He said, Cain, if you do what you're supposed to do, everything's going to be all right. But Cain was offended because what he wanted to do wasn't accepted. You know what? There's a lot of things that goes on in this world that people want to do and they enjoy doing and they take pleasure in doing. And I ain't been but just a week or so back that I mentioned the fact out of Hebrews chapter 11 when they're referring to Moses that there is pleasure in sin for a season. But the pleasure don't always stay. After a while, reality sets in. There's a payday. There's a reckoning. There's a result of sin. And the wages of sin is that. But Cain got upset. He got mad at God. Couldn't take it out on God. So took it out on his brother. God came to him. Where's your brother? How do I know I'm my brother's keeper? God looked at him in verse 11 and said, Now art thou cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood in thy, from thy head. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Cain was probably one of the best farmers you'd ever meet. He probably raised some of the biggest watermelons, some of the biggest taters. He probably had some of the prettiest half grown beans you've ever seen in your life. Might even got three ears of corn on a stalk. I don't know. But he was proud of what he had done. But the Bible says now in verse 11, Thou art cursed from the earth. You say, what do you mean? Even the earth itself is going to publicly denounce and condemn Cain. Cain, you've been able to grow. You've been able to prosper. You've been able to plant. You've been able to reap. You've been able to sow. You've been able to harvest. But now the earth itself is going to turn against you because the earth has had to soak up your brother's blood. The earth is not even going to return back the fruits of your labors anymore. The earth itself is going to publicly condemn you for what you've done. Cain said, I'll be a fugitive and I'll be a vagabond. He said, I'll have to wander from place to place. There's nowhere that I can go. There's nowhere that I'm going to be safe. I'm going to have to just go here, there, and everywhere else. And anybody sees me, they're going to kill me. God said, oh, no, it ain't going to be that easy. I'm going to put a mark on you so that nobody's going to kill you. Cain, for the rest of your days, you're going to live with what you've done. You're going to have to remember what you've done. Oh, let me tell you something. Cain was trying to be religious. He was trying to do it his way, but it wasn't God's way. He decided he'd take matters into his own hands. Well, God will accept my brother. I'll get my brother out of the picture, and God will have to accept me for who I am. Folks, that's the biggest mistake this world's ever made. God will not accept us for who we are. Our righteousness is filthy rags. God is not going to accept filth. He's not going to accept unrighteousness. He will not accept sin and iniquity. The Bible teaches us. That's why flesh cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You will be washed. You will be cleansed. You will be saved by the blood of Christ. Or you will not go in. Again, it does not matter. And I'm going to repeat something I said Friday. You can be the most faithful member of this church that there is. You might be able to preach a good sermon. You might be able to teach a good lesson. And you might be able to sing a song so pretty that you make the angels jealous. But without Jesus, you're lost and you're going to go to hell. Now it's that plain. And God tells him this. You're going to live with what you've done. So let's just look at Cain, let's just look. And you hear me this morning. Cain, from that point, God turned his back on him. Now, do you understand that? There is going to come a day that doors are going to be closed. They'll be closed like they were closed in the ark. They'll be shut off like they were with Cain. There'll come a day just like with Nineveh. Go back and read the book of Jonah. Jonah preached. There was a great revival. They turned to God. They repented in sackcloth and ashes. Yep. 
But when you read the book of Nahum, 150 years later, they had forgotten God. Yeah. They had got away from God. They'd gone back to their sinful living. And when you look at the book of Nahum, if I remember correctly, all it refers to is the judgment of God, and at no point does God offer them another chance of repentance. The day will come when you can sin away your day of grace. Be careful. It ain't nothing to make fun of. It ain't nothing to take lightly. I'll get saved whenever I want. No, you won't. So let's look at Cain. Cain thought he was good enough. Cain thought he was religious enough. But we need to understand this morning, and that's just a simple message. Just, I'm going to give you some things, and it won't be nothing new. You know the Scriptures as good as I do. But you better know this morning that you're saved. And you better understand the importance. And I'm going to say this. You better understand the importance of getting your lost family and your lost loved ones in the house of God. Right. You better understand the importance of getting your lost family and your lost loved ones under the sound of solid do Bible doctrinal preaching. Yep. Now, it, it, we're not talking about this feel good pat on the back stuff. Yeah. I'm talking about calling sin, sin. Preaching hell, hot, heaven, sweet, eternity long. Without Jesus, eternity and hell going to last just as long as it will in heaven. You're not going to be annihilated. You're not going to hell and all of a sudden be destroyed. That's not going to happen. So today, the only hope that I have is in Christ. Because in myself, I'm nothing. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, or yeah, that there is none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Mm -hmm. There's not a one of us in here fit to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that as an insult. I mean it as cold, hard fact. Brother Travis, without Jesus, you deserve to be in hell this morning. Yeah. Now, it's that plain. Without Jesus, I deserve it this morning Amen. to be in the pits of hell. Yeah. I deserve to be in those blistering walls right now. Mm -hmm. There is nothing good about me. I am what I am by the grace of God and without Christ hell is what I'd be looking for. You need to understand how much God loved us. He loved us enough that he sent Jesus to die. You say, well, preach. no. See, without Christ we're not good. He told Cain if thou doest well, thou will be accepted. Well, what is well? Well is doing what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. Well is following God's prescribed order. Well is being saved the way God says we're going to be saved. Otherwise, we're lost, we're undone, we're no good, we're unrighteous, we're wicked in the sight of God. You say, I don't want to hear that. I'm a good moral man. I'm a good moral woman. That doesn't matter. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? Right. Say, preacher, you can't prove that. Yeah, I can. We talked about it before in Matthew chapter 25. There were ten virgins. Mm -hmm. They were all morally good. But there were five wise and five foolish. Your next door neighbor may never beat his wife, may never cuss, may have never killed anybody, may have never stole anybody. He's the best neighbor that you'll ever find in your life. And yet he's left Christ out. He's morally good, but in the sight of God, he's wicked. Because in the sight of God, there's none of us good, no, not one. Amen. And the Bible tells us in Psalm chapter 10, the wicked will not seek after God. See, they don't look for Him. They don't want Him. They'll not seek after God, and God is not at all in their thoughts. That's why the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Fine. David said the same thing Paul did in Romans chapter 3. There's none that seeketh after Him. You didn't find God. You didn't go looking for Him. The day that you realized you needed a Savior was the day the Holy Spirit of God came knocking on your heart's door. Amen. The day I realized I needed a Savior was the day that
that God sent that spirit of God. He began to knock on my heart and say, hey, let me in. Let me change your life. Realize you need Jesus. Realize you're a sinner in yourself. Realize without Christ you're doomed and have no hope. And yet people go through this life unconcerned, uncaring. It's got to the point now we stand out on the porch before church time. These cars go up and down the road. You throw your hand up and they won't even look toward the church. You say, well, they're just trying to watch the road. No, they ain't. No, they ain't. They don't want nothing to do with the house of God. They don't want nothing to do with the people of God. They don't want nothing to do with God himself. Right. If they did, they'd be here. Right. Or they'd be somewhere. <laughs> that rich man in Luke chapter 12, the one that tore his barns down and built up bigger, never given any thought to God before in his life. But that night that he died, that God came to him and said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Who shall these things be then? Well, he thought about him then, didn't he? Wonder what he thought when he was when he was in that in that pits of hell. Well, all these barns that I built are doing me no good now. My big fine house is doing me no good now. All my money is doing me no good now. I wonder if him and the rich man from Luke chapter 16, when they joined one another, wonder if they had the conversation. Oh, why did we leave out God? Why did we leave him out? We thought this was all there was to it. And the majority of the people in this world today, they, that's all it is. That's all it is. I met a woman a while back and she was talking about somebody else that worked at the funeral home and, and she said, we do church together. I said, you do church together? How do you do church? Well, we attend the same one. Oh, okay. Uh, some of these new phrases that people come out with. Yeah. That's why I don't care for worship centers. Right. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. If it's a church, call it a church. Amen. Right. Yeah. If you're a Baptist, don't be ashamed of being a Baptist. Amen. If you're a Methodist, don't be ashamed of being a Methodist. Amen. If you're a Moravian, don't be ashamed to be a Moravian. Right. Some of these non-denominationals, oh, they're just trying to skip around and pick out the best they ain't deciding what they are yet. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Might as well just go with it. And it's those that scare me. It's those that scare me. Because what doctrine are they teaching? Let's think about that big one down there in Houston. It's just Lakewood Church. At least it's got church on the end of it. But you don't hear sin. You don't hear judgment. Amen. You don't hear repentance. Right. Mm -mm. And any more of that R word, that's a, that, that, man, that's an offense to anybody that hears it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to repent. Why do I need to change? Because God said, unless except we repent, we're going to perish. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 59, I, I love, I love, and I can't even remember which verse it is, in, and it might be the first one for that matter. It said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. I love that, but we forget the next verse. He says, But your sins and your iniquities have separated between you and God. Your sins have turned his face towards you that he will not hear. We get to the point God wants to save and God wants to bless. God wants to heal. God wants to heal our land. But I'm afraid there's a cry come up from the United States of America that's, real, that's coming real close to matching the cry that the Bible says came up from Sodom and Gomorrah. Yep. And because of unrepentant sinners, because of unconfessed sin, unconfessed iniquity, God has turned his head and said, I'm not going to listen. Right. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You better be thankful. If today you don't know Jesus, there's people in this world, in this country, this county, 
that do not know Jesus refuse accepted, they better be thankful. They better be glad. There's still some godly people in this county that there's still some that's still trying to do right, still trying to seek God, still trying to follow Him, still calling on His name, still begging God to forgive our nation. Right. Because if it wasn't for the godly people that was in this nation already, we have already gone down the tubes. Don't tell me it wouldn't have happened. For all of our power, because of all for all of our wealth, and because of our influence, the United States is becoming one of the most wicked nations there is on the face of this earth. Mm-hmm. And our sins and our iniquities. Cain, call on me. I don't care. Cain said, My punishment is more than I can bear. Okay, you should have realized that. You should have realized what was coming. Don't tell me. Now you think about this. Don't tell me that Cain and Abel had not heard Daddy talk to them at night. Oh, you better follow God. You better do what God tells you to do. Let me tell you what happened when we was in the paradise of God. When we was... When we was in that garden of God, when we was over there in Eden and everything was perfect and there was nothing wrong and God cast us out because of eating a piece of fruit. God takes disobedience serious. Mm-hmm. What did I say Wednesday night? Ignorance is one thing, but the opposite of ignorance is disobedience. When we know to do right and do it not, the book of James says it is sin. Pure and simple. Cain, Abel, we were going to live forever. We didn't have to work. Everything was provided for. All the animals had come up and we had Pet them and God had come down in the cool of the day and oh we'd walk and we'd spend that time with him and we enjoyed it and he blessed us so wonderfully. Please don't disobey him. Please do what he tells you to do. Please do it his way. And Cain didn't heed daddy. He didn't heed God. He didn't heed his brother. Cain said, I'm going to do it my way. And he finally crossed that line. And God said, I'm done. And God turned his head and turned his face away from Cain. But understand, it makes no difference on religion. I'm going to say it one more time. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, and I will profess unto them in that day, Depart from me. For I never knew you. You say, God don't know I exist. God knows you exist. But that word know does not just mean he had knowledge of you. Now, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to be vulgar. I'm not going to be crude. Don't you understand something? When we read in Scripture, that Adam knew his wife. Mm-hmm. We know what that means. When we talk about knowing God, we are talking about having an intimate, close relationship with Him. We're not being vulgar. We're talking about knowing Him and walking with Him and having fellowship with Him and being in God and God in us. And if we don't have that relationship that Jesus will say in that day, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. Mm -hmm. Oh, he knew about us. That's why he sent the Spirit of God to convict us of our sin. But when it came time for the Spirit of God to introduce us to Christ, I know who President Biden is. 
But I don't know President Biden. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. People that have not been saved, they know who Jesus is. But they don't know Jesus. And they've never allowed the Holy Spirit of God to introduce them to Christ. And the only thing that seals that relationship is the blood. And Cain refused to have the blood. And Jesus said, In that day I'll profess unto them, Depart from me, for I never knew you. And he repeated himself in Matthew chapter 25. He said, Depart from me into everlasting fire that prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, God wouldn't send him. In God's love, he won't send people to hell. He doesn't. You choose. And all he does is punch your ticket. Now, I'm not being funny. You reject Christ, you're making a choice for hell. You're doing it. I'm doing it. If I reject him, I'm choosing hell. And yet, we're just like Cain. We'll get to hell and we'll say, my punishment's more than I can bear. When you look in verse number 5, he refused to have the proper sacrifice. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> we need to understand that from the very beginning, the very beginning up to right now, from the very beginning until the very end, it's the blood and the blood only. What did God do in Genesis chapter 3? He came down the cool of the day. Adam, where art thou? Adam sort of hollered out from behind the bushes and said, Lord, I was naked and I hid myself. Him and Eve had sewed fig leaves together, tried to make aprons to cover up their nakedness, cover up their sin. Mm -hmm. Who told you he is naked? You gotta confess that sin before you're saved. Mm -hmm. But what did God do? God took coats of skins and clothed them. And I know I made this statement before God could have spoke the word and those coats of skins would have been there. But I don't believe it happened. I think God Himself, listen, God Himself made that first sacrifice. And showed them that the blood had to be shed in the Garden of Eden and innocent had to die for their sins to be atoned. He took those skins, he clothed them, but the physical, the damage had already been done to the physical body. They began to die the moment that they sinned against God. He made those coats of skins and clothed them, and we look ahead a couple of thousand years in Genesis chapter 22 chapter 23 when God said to Abraham now take thy son thine only son Isaac and you take him to a place and I'll show you and you offer him up to me as a sacrifice they go three days journey they're right there at the foot of Mount Moriah They began to take the wooden stuff off the back of the animal and put it on the back of Isaac. And that'll preach in itself because thank God they took the burden off the animals and put it on the sun. Mm -hmm. That'll preach. And he looked at him and he said, Daddy, we missing something. See, Abraham had already taught that little boy well. That wasn't his first trip to church. Mm -hmm. That wasn't his first trip to make an offering. Mm -hmm. That wasn't his first trip to make a sacrifice. Yeah. Children need to be brought in early. They need to be taught from an early age. Yeah. Jesus loves me. That's child abuse. But not bringing your child to church. Mm -hmm. 
Daddy, we got the wood, we got the fire. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? He didn't know that he was going to be it. And he said, son, God will provide himself a lamb. I thank God. But up the mountain to go. Y'all know the account. You know what happened. You know that while they was going up one side, thank God the ram was coming up the other side. It was caught in the thorns around his head. Just that picture of the crown of thorns on, on the Lamb of God himself. But that boy knew. Isaac knew. Something's got to die. Something has to shed its blood. Something has got to take the place from my sin. You said, but that Old Testament ain't what we apply to. No, Hebrews still tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It's still the blood. Still the blood. And it's not about goodness, and it's not about works, and it's not about trying to do God a favor. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And now that Christ has gone to the cross, the blood is particular. It's not just another lamb. It's not a prize bull. It's not about a turtle dove. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Christ our Passover has died for us. And it still tells us in Acts chapter 4 that there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Let's get specific. 1 John chapter 1 says it is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanseth from all sin. So not only does it still, Cain, it still has to be the blood. It has to be the blood of Christ because without, God, without the blood of the Son of God, you're lost today. I'm going to quit here in a minute. I ain't going to get finished, but I'm going to quit. When we look at what Cain went through, he refused God's instruction. You look in chapter 6 and 7. We read it a few minutes ago. God told him, if you do well, you'll be accepted. And only one way to do his will, and that's God's way. And what have you done today? It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if you die lost, you have died out of the will of God. When you die lost, that's because you've refused to do the will of God. God don't want you to go to hell. God would have all men everywhere to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. My way, you're accepted. Your way, sin still lies at the door. There is nothing... I can do outside of Christ. You say, preacher, that's why people don't like Christianity. They're too narrow-minded. We ain't narrow-minded enough. Right, that's right. We ain't. There's too many things that Christians still that slide. There's too many standards Christians are knocked down. Yep. Right. Bless your heart, folks. There ought to be a difference in us and people that ain't saved. Ought to be different in the way we live and the way we look, where we go and what we do. Abraham begged God not to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew Lot was down there. He knew his family was there. He knew his own blood kid was there. Begged God. Started at 50 and got down to 10. And that's why I'm convinced today. That Lot had not just two unmarried daughters, he had three married daughters. Because you got their sons-in-law. Remember? He had sons-in-law. They laughed at him. Abraham said, I know how many is there. If I can get God down to ten, everything will be alright. But Lot had three daughters and three sons-in-law that were not righteous. But thank God he still got Lot and this Lot and the two daughters out. And we've seen how the two daughters turned out. Yeah. And Mama, she missed it so bad. She turned around and looked. And became a pillar of salt. 
God does not want you to perish. God does not want you to be doomed. He does not want you to go to hell. And you say, but preacher, I don't see anything wrong with my way. And that's why Proverbs chapter 14 says, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Preacher, there's nothing wrong with the way I do things. There's a preacher on Facebook and and I can tell by some of y'all's comments, y'all follow him a whole lot. I don't. That a few years back, a couple of years ago, whatever it was, two, three years ago, his wife left him. Mm-hmm. And the people in this church didn't have no problem. Baptist, by the way, y'all. Right. Not Southern Baptist. Independent, fundamental Baptist. Yeah. And within about eight months of his wife leaving him, he is already married to the church secretary. Yep. They got one of them quickie divorces. Oh, my wife slept. Yeah, well. Shut up, boy. It's all right. No, it ain't. Not the sight of God. That's right. He ain't qualified to pastor. That's right. And scripturally, he's living in the dark. Right. Let's go on with this. I got to quit now. What do you do? You do the same thing that Paul told the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. It's Christ and Christ alone. Just Jesus. And I'm going to say it again like I said it Friday. Jesus is enough. Right. You don't need anything else. Because when you've got Jesus, scripturally, according to 1 John, you don't get the Father until you have the Son. You don't get the Son until you've accepted the Holy Spirit. So once you've got, thank God it's a package deal. You get, when, when you got Jesus and you've confessed Him as Lord and you've accepted His blood as payment for your sins and you put your faith in the finished work at Calvary and an empty tomb, Thank God you got the Holy Spirit, you got God the Son, and you got God the Father all at one time. Mm-hmm. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6 He that cometh to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You say, wait a minute, preacher. You said there was none that sought after God. No, once you put your faith in Him, follow this logically now. Let's go biblically. Once you put your faith in Him, you will seek to know more about Him. Then you will go after Him. Uh And then, thank God, if you truly, diligently seek Him, He will keep on and on. He is a rewarder of them. It is worth. It's worth the trip. It's worth the work to get to know Him. Spend that time. If any man lacks knowledge, let him ask a God who give it liberally. So what do we do? I hope God will let me finish this tonight. Cain is in hell today. I'm not his judge. I'm just telling you what Scripture says. Because if God had turned His back on Cain and walked away from him, then Cain lost all his opportunities. He was just as lost as those people that refused to go inside the door of that ark. But once the door was closed, it was too late. Mm-hmm. Cain, what am I supposed to do? I bet if we, we could talk to him right now. Remember what the rich man in Luke chapter 16 said? Send Lazarus back. I got five brothers. I don't want them coming to this place. I don't want them to come here. They got Moses and the prophets. They wouldn't believe if one rose from the dead. You say, preacher, I would, then why don't you put your faith in Christ? Because right. he's already risen from the dead. Right. So that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That simple. The blood's already shed. Anything other than the blood. That's why no other religion will get you to heaven. None. It's through the blood. Pure and simple. This morning, do you know Jesus? Not know about Him. 
Not know that He exists, but do you know Jesus? Do you accept the blood that He shed at Calvary? Or are you trying to get in on your works? Do you accept the fact there is an empty tomb? Or are you going to try to get there on your good behavior? Cain said, what I do myself and the work of my hands is going to be enough. Uh -uh. No, sir, it ain't a head, a head work and it ain't a hands work. It's a heart work. Right. Oh, there's a lot of people that tell you, oh, I believe in God. Yes, sir. Well, you'd be a fool not to. The heavens declare his handiwork. The visible things of this world declare the invisible God. <clears throat> I believe that Jesus existed. Sure you do. He's a historical figure. Right. But you must believe that He is. Yeah. Is what? Is what He said He was. Yeah. And is who He says He is. Yeah. So to, this morning, is your faith in the blood or is your faith in yourself? Father, we thank You for the privilege of being here. We thank you for each one of these that's made their way out. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to look at a portion of your word. And I pray, God, this morning, I said what you'd have me to say. Pray that I did what you'd have me to do. Father, I pray now that you'll take the message and use it. I pray, Father, that you will touch hearts and touch lives. I pray, Father, today that if there is anybody under the sound of my voice that does not know Christ, that, Father, you will touch that heart, convict that soul, let them see that need, let them realize that without Jesus, they have nothing to look forward to. That just as Cain is, they're just wandering around this world in circles. And that when they leave, hell's going to be home. God, I'm begging you today, there might be somebody that you've dealt with many times and I'm asking you, God, today deal with them again. Give them another chance. Give them another opportunity. I'm begging you, God, don't shut the door. You have your way in this invitation and for what you do, we'll thank you, we'll praise you and we'll give you the honor and the glory for we ask it in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Listen to me today. Do